Welcome to the InfoWars Nightly News. It is Friday, June 12th, 2015, and I'm Leanne McAdoo. Here is a look at tonight's top stories. Tonight, how a trade deal would affect us all. Then, what's your racial identity? And a top economist predicts a collapse after October. That's next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Don't think you're part of the power structure because you're a trendy out there. And because you go along with this, they see you as a useful idiot. That's what Lenin called his moron followers. Well, some good news for now. Fast Track Authority has failed in the House, and it was actually the Democrats that helped block the final passage of the Fast Track Authority. Uh, they rejected a displaced workers aid program that they are normally in support of. Now, Pelosi and Boehner engineered this deal in order to advance a trade framework to the floor. And it was under the agreement that Democrats could score a vote on something called trade adjustment assistance. So TAA was going to be a method to sort of cushion the blow for various workers and industries that are going to be damaged by reallocation to jobs going overseas. So obviously they know that's a big deal that's going to be happening. But Democrats actually blocked the TAA, knowing that if they did that, it would bring the TPA to a screeching halt. Now, if the TPA does pass, which it is scheduled to go up for a vote once again on Tuesday with a lot of people, including Senator Jeff Sessions, saying it probably is going to pass, well, now... They don't have the, the bargaining power of the TAA. So there's no protections, no workers' protections that are going to be in place. So I'm hesitant to call this a victory just yet. Now, Nancy Pelosi had this to say. She says, our people would rather have a job than trade assistance. We have to slow down on the fast track bill. She said, whatever the deal is with other countries, we want a better deal for America's workers. So a little frightening there that I agree with Nancy Pelosi, and that's why I'm, you know, a little hesitant. I don't really think that we know everything that's going on at the present moment with the TAA and the TPP and the TPA, <laughs> all of these confusing acronyms. But that's the key. Whatever is inside the TPP, they know that jobs are going to be lost. And so there has to be some sort of worker protections involved with this. And Fast Track itself is a threat to democracy. Now, Senator Jeff Sessions calls the TPP a new form of global governance structure. He said the creation of it would be authorized through the six-year fast-track executive authority. Now, the key here that we keep telling everyone and bringing this up again and again and again, the key is that fast-track is going to grant the next president the ability to make amendments to any of these trade agreements via executive order. So this fast track authority is for the next six years, it will be like a living document. So why would anyone want to hand that power over to any president? That is what is really frightening about this. And a lot of people are saying, oh, we'll have six months of debate. No, we will not. And we'll have about 60 days to see the TPP and it's a up or down vote. And Sessions actually goes on and says, under fast track, Congress transfers its authority to the executive and they agree to give up several of its most basic powers. These concessions include the power to write legislation, the power to amend legislation, the power to fully consider legislation that's on the floor, and the power to keep debate open until Senate cloture is invoked, and of course the constitutional requirement that treaties receive a two-thirds vote. He says, in other words, through fast track, Congress is basically pre-clearing a political and economic union before a word of that arrangement is even seen by a single person. Now, that's not what we heard by um, Paul Ryan, who said, this is going to give Congress even more power. And Boehner said, this is going to create even more jobs. All of these things are lies. So there is a lot of confusion with what's going on. And I tend to agree here with uh, Senator Sessions, who's basically saying that this TPP is going to create a new global governance structure. In rare form, President Obama raced over to the Capitol to plead with his own party to pass the three sections to be voted on in order to fast track his secret globalist trade deal. A trade deal that Ways and Means Committee Chairman Paul Ryan arrogantly vomited. It's declassified and made public once it's agreed to. 
echoing the hubris of Nancy Pelosi's ramming of the middle-class life savings killer, Obamacare, when she declared, we have to pass the bill so that you can find out what's in it. But Pelosi turned the tables on her dear leader on Friday and instructed her party to ignore the president in order to slow the fast-track authority. And so while I'm a big supporter of TAA, if TAA slows down the fast track, I am prepared to vote against TAA because then its defeat, sad to say, is the only way that we will be able to slow down the fast track. 15 minute vote. The U.S. House wraps up debate and begins three votes on trade measures. The first one dealing with trade adjustment assistance. This provides economic assistance to workers or communities who are displaced by trade deals. The second vote, if that first vote ha is approved, is on the Trade Promotion Authority, the so-called Fast Track Authority, giving the president the ability to submit trade deals to Congress for an up or down vote. And the last bill, it deals with customs enforcement, a customs enforcement measure that also contains penalties for countries involved in trade deals that also manipulate their currency. But this first vote is essential. It's a 15-minute vote because if this doesn't clear, it is likely that the, uh, the second vote won't happen. At high noon on Friday, Texas time, Obama was handed his tuchus by his own party and the successful pressure waged on them by the labor unions. The final tally on the crushing defeat of the trade adjustment assistance bill was 302 nays to 126 yeas. A three to one margin of raging Democratic disapproval of their can do no wrong Democratic president's policies. This is what a capitalist democracy convulsing in its death throes as it attempts its metamorphosis into a corporatocracy looks like. In order for the TPA, the fast tracking amendment free trade promotion authority to have any teeth, the TAA needed to pass. The self touted progressive TAA, a program designed to help workers displaced by trade that Democrats had supported but when tied to the Trade Pacific Partnership, took on a whole new meaning of discombobulated trade regulations, dictatorial executive powers, no job displacement welfare, and economic upheaval. The TPA will now hobble on as a toothless beggar into the next administration as it has a lifespan of five years. Throughout the TPA process, Senator Jeff Sessions issued critical alerts bringing attention to Paul Ryan's deception and saying, promoters of fast track executive authority have relied on semantic obfuscation in an effort to deny the obvious. The president's top priority is obtaining fast track authority because he knows it will expand his powers and allow him to cement his legacy through the formation of a new political and economic union. Backstabbing House Speaker John Boehner, who voted on the TAA, even though the Speaker rarely votes, now has two options to sycophantically toady up to his aristocratic CEO overlords. Either proceed with a re-vote on Tuesday and attempt to get 80 more votes, or send the legislation back to the Senate for a major overhaul. After the defeat of the TAA, and before the vote on the TPA, Majority Leader Representative Kevin McCarthy of California said, Members are advised that we are proceeding to votes on the remaining two motions. Uh, I would advise the members that the world is watching, and I encourage every member of the House to vote yes. I yield back. We're watching, all right, Mr. McCarthy. We're watching your political career, Paul Ryan's foolhardy ambition, Boehner's legacy of betrayal, and most of the GOP go down the toilet. Back in the lair of the Bilderberg Pawn, Obama's White House haughtily dismissed today's defeat as a procedural snafu. John Bound for Infowars.com. One of the items on this year's Bilderberg agenda is the elite's ongoing war on cash. Well, now, top economic forecaster Martin Armstrong is predicting a crash coming just after October. Martin Armstrong began his studies into market behavior. Armstrong's work has become world-renowned. The model has successfully pinpointed not merely major specific days when events will be in advance, but it has provided one of the most consistent guides for understanding the turning points in the global economy and thus the business cycle, not merely within a domestic economy, but within the global economy on the collective basis. ArmstrongEconomics.com. In 85, forming the G5, the dollar was up dramatically at that point. The, the Deutsche Mark was like four to the dollar. Um, and they basically 
just stood up and said, okay, fine, we're going to, you know, we want to see the dollar 40% lower. And that was the 87 crash. And because I went public and warned them they were going to create this crash if they do this, I mean, a common sense, you, you sold the Japanese, you know, everything from Rockefeller Center on down. And they own like more than a third of the U.S. national debt. Now you stand up and you say you're going to devalue it by 40 percent. Don't you think they would sell? Um, there's no rational discussion with these people. And so they just started selling, and that was your 87 crash. Let's talk about this secret meeting in London to end cash. And along with that now is this huge push in the media to get rid of cash. Uh, that's a bold move, but but uh, again, let's talk about why they would well, want to do that, A, but then B, about the secret meeting. Well, that's how they, they pull this off. The, the media is part of the tool. And it was Larry Summers who first came out and said, gee, interest rates should go negative. Now, he wasn't in the administration. He was just at Harvard. So what happens is they can, if the market rejects it, they can say, oh, that's just him talking. If it accepts it, all right, they're right behind it. So this is how politics really works. So what you're seeing right now is the media coming out, yeah, 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 we should get rid of cash. You know, and that is, is the balloon. They're floating. They're trying it. to get... Yes. The reason I've been pretty much so vocal, um, being, coming from the professional side, liquidity is, is absolutely evaporating. And it is scary because that means when this thing turns down after October and, and government bonds, etc., you're going to see a massive, I mean, collapse, massive. Means when this thing turns down after October and, and government bonds, etc., you're going to see a massive, I mean, collapse, massive, because there's no bid. Good God. And it, it's really, capital is scared to death everywhere. And They've been selling the longer-term paper, 10-year bonds, et cetera. The bonds have crashed. And they're moving everything into like 30-day to, to six-month paper max. And because nobody knows what's going on. Well, earlier this week, we learned that hackers linked to China hacked into the U.S. government. Well, now some things have come to light, letting us realize that this hack was a little bit more serious than what we were first told. These hackers may have accessed security clearance info for U.S. intelligence as well as military personnel. Now, obviously, much more damaging than the original vague story that, you know, a few personnel files were accessed and things. Just a little cybersecurity breach. Now, the forms that were accessed were known as Standard Form 86. And these require applicants to fill out very personal information. This includes histories of mental illness, past arrests, any backgrounds in previous alcohol or drug problems, uh, arrests, things like that. And one of the big thing, things that they're telling us is that they've also accessed all the social security numbers, which were not encrypted. J. David Cox, who is the president of the American Federation of Government Employees, said in a letter that, we believe that the central personnel data file was the targeted database and that the hackers are now in possession of all personnel data for every federal employee, every federal retiree, and up to a million former federal employees. And the union believes that these hackers stole military records and veteran status information, address, birth date, job and pay history, health insurance, life insurance, and pension information, as well as age, gender, and race data. So obviously this is a huge data breach and of course of utmost concern at the present moment are those uh, US employees who are stationed uh, overseas and especially in countries like China. Now a cybersecurity failure that, that is just so huge with this is the fact that they did not even encrypt these people's social security numbers. So this just means that all the wrong people can do all sorts of awful things with these people's identities. Now, what we're also learning that makes this OPM hack such a catastrophe is that it went undetected for more than a year. The NSA did not discover the malware here. They did not discover this hack. Totally useless agency there, the NSA. 
a private company discovered that there was Chinese hackers linked into the government system. So it was a private company giving the Office of Personnel Management a software demonstration, trying to show them how they needed to update their software. And it was then that they discovered that indeed Chinese hackers had installed some malware there in their in this uh, in this agency. So hopefully this private corporation, this private company was awarded a contract. But these are the people that are taking all of our metadata and telling us not to worry about it. These are the people that we're supposed to be trusting with all of our health insurance when they want to federalize the the health completely change the way that we do healthcare in this country and we're supposed to be trusting them with their with our personal information. So I'm I'm sure that we're not going to hear the argument, oh well, if you've got nothing to hide, then why are you worried about it now that it's actually going to be affecting people who work directly there in the government. So we're not really, you know, this isn't really a big threat, you know, the fact that Chinese hackers could hack into the government, infiltrate the Office of Personnel Management and the NSA didn't even catch it. That's not a big deal. And uh, Obama just wants everyone to think that climate change is the big deal. That's the huge national threat. And it's not even the threat. This other story that came out this week in just under a year, ISIS has collected enough radioactive material to create weapons of mass destruction. They are now, it has been confirmed that ISIS has stockpiled enough radioactive material to create a weapon of mass destruction, and Obama admits he doesn't have a plan. So it's a totally unfair and unbalanced fight. And now the rebels are the freedom fighters. The, uh, the Syrian National Army are, uh, are being beaten every place around Syria. So yeah. we've got to change the battlefield situation. And just sending arms, very frankly, uh, although they need them very badly, they need anti-tank and anti-air weapons, are, is not going to change the situation on the ground. And the massacre goes on. ISIS blatantly supported by John McCain and the Pentagon and hesitantly supplied tanks, rocket launchers, missile and anti-aircraft systems in accidental airdrops. According to volunteer forces who are fighting the terrorists, American helicopters dropped boxes of weapons in Yathrib and Balad districts in the Salahuddin province. Now, the airdrop comes as the Iraqi army and volunteers are making significant gains against the terrorist group there. Now, back in October, the U.S. military admitted that a bundle of ammunition and weapons it had dropped over the Syrian border town of Kobani had ended up in the hands of ISIL members. Now it has been confirmed that ISIS has stockpiled enough radioactive material to create weapons of mass destruction. In the ISIS magazine Dabiq, ISIS declared their intent to acquire a nuclear warhead from Pakistan with their billions of stolen funds gobbled up as they ransacked banks and took control of oil fields across Iraq and Syria. ISIS claims that all they have to do is call on their leaders in Pakistan to purchase a nuclear device through weapons dealers with links to corrupt officials in the region. India's defense minister Rao Inderjit Singh made the remark with the rise of ISIS in West Asia one is afraid to an extent that perhaps they might get access to a nuclear arsenal from states like Pakistan. Bloomberg quoted him as saying, ISIS admits that the scenario is a bit exaggerated, but then points out that a few thousand tons of ammonium nitrate explosive used in mining operations or the weaponization of toxic chlorine as the gas berthalite would be easy enough to make. And it's designed to target mainly an American audience that is not geopolitically informed and doesn't know what's been happening for over two and a half years in Syria, where NATO and the United States, that includes France, England, you name it, have injected over 100,000 foreign fighters from Saudi Arabia, from uh, Qatar, from so many other countries that are al-Qaeda in over 60% of the cases. That's admitted. They are engaging in incredible atrocities across the nation. And three times in the last two years, they have been caught staging chemical attacks. They've been caught. Even mainstream news admits in the back of the paper, okay, they staged it. It's the type they used, they did it, to blame Assad and the, and the, and the Syrian military so they can take over. 
There is a reason why President Obama There's has There's a reason the White House science are wrote a book about brain damaging us with the it. proliferation of these weapons. Because you're a bunch of murderous, down, psychopathic bastards. And there I'm so sick of watching you Obama commit crime after crime and running Al-Qaeda. That this John international Kerry, norm cannot be liar, violated without liar, consequences. Liar, 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 And there is a reason why no matter what you believe about Syria. No matter what you believe. All peoples and all, all nations. people who believe in the cause of our common humanity. Our humanity should support them injecting Al-Qaeda rebels to try to overthrow the government and so kill all the Christians. ISIS is about 30,000 Iraqis. They're not technically trained uh, to fight. They have only the heavy equipment that they capture from, uh, from us. Australian Foreign Minister Julie Bishop says NATO is deeply concerned about radioactive materials ISIS has seized from research centers and hospitals that are exclusive to government stockpiles. ISIS has already been pushing its way into Saudi Arabia, Yemen, and other parts of the Middle East, becoming as UK Home Secretary Theresa May declared, just months away from becoming the world's first truly terrorist state. ISIS has essentially reached this plateau of potential mass devastation in roughly one year. They will not rest until their perfect storm of globalized militant groups have unleashed its full scope of U.S.-backed intelligence and funding on the American public. Of course, whether they have weapons or not is beside the point. ISIS is already very successful at engaging the media in a giant psyop to terrorize the public and keep a firm grip on American freedoms as deemed necessary by the elite corporocratic succubus as they prepare the final phases of construction of the superstructure of a new world order. John Bound for Infowars.com. Congratulations, Mr. Watson. Thank you, sir. I'll do my best. Some people yeah. do anything to get into Harvard. Mom, Dad, I'm black. What? what? No, you're crazy. Mark Watson. Come on now! That was a clip from an 80s movie, Soul Man, where an affluent white teenager fakes being black in order to get into Harvard. Now, when that movie first came out, it caused a lot of backlash because obviously we have a white actor in blackface. Well, it sort of ties into this next story that has gone viral today. A prominent civil rights leader and NAACP president has been outed as a Caucasian who has been pretending to be black for at least a decade. Now, normally, lefties would jump all over this story because it's the ultimate cultural appropriation. But the issue is that for the better half of the year, progressives have really been pushing uh, for this acceptance movement for self-identification. Should self-identification trump objective truth? So the critics of self-identification as objective truth finally have their test case. So according to her parents, Rachel Dolezal has been disguising herself as an African-American after she assimilated herself in with that community and that culture nearly 20 years ago. Dozal is president of the Spokane, Washington chapter of the NAACP. She also chairs a city police oversight commission. She earned her master's degree from Howard University, which is a historically black college in D.C. And uh, she's also an adjunct professor of Africana studies at Eastern Washington University. She writes several blog posts about living as an African-American here in America. And uh, she's also states on her bio that she's been the victim of numerous, at least eight documented hate crimes. No suspects have ever been identified in those hate crimes. And it was actually the latest hate crime that she claimed to be a victim of that caused uh, her true identity to be revealed. She claimed that someone had put some letters and pictures of lynching in the NAACP's P.O. box uh, but the, the post office said that, that there was a problem with that because it had never been processed through the mail. There was no barcode on it, and that the only person that could have put it, put it in there and put it in that mailbox was either a, an em postal employee or someone with the key to that P.O. box. So then this caused a local news station to start doing a little investigating of their own. They confronted her, and they say, you know, are your parents white? And a, a vine that's been looping all day is her saying, I don't, I don't understand the question. I don't know what you're talking about. So then they went and they found her white parents 
who outed her and they were, you know, they said they haven't been in touch with their daughter for years because she didn't want them around because they would blow her cover and all this stuff. And they were kind of upset about the fact that she was passing off her younger adopted brother as her son. So now normally, like I said, this would be the ultimate story of cultural appropriation. But now we are forced to ask, what is the material difference between Rachel Dolezal and Caitlyn Jenner? Ooh, everyone's saying, you know, race is just a construct anyway. So why does it matter how people classify themselves? And in her heart, she is black. So shouldn't we be actually really upset with her parents who outed her and refused to accept the identity that she has assumed? She self-identifies as a black woman and she has gone really hard in the paint to live this life. So what is that, guys? Okay, I'm hearing that we actually might have some footage of uh, Rachel Dolezal getting her uh, diversity training. Let's go a little bit of slang in there. Say, yo, that jacket is tight, son. Yeah, you know I me. Mean? Yo, that jacket is tight, son. Yeah, you know I me. Mean? Yeah, you know I me. Mean? Okay, yeah, so something like that. I don't believe you, people. Huh. What do you mean, you people? What do you mean, you people? Huh? I so obviously we're just having a little bit of fun here today, but that's it. That's the big diversion tactic. It's getting us all talking about, are we really free here in America? If we're free, we'll be free to wear a dress or we're free to get a total race lift if we want to recognize ourselves as black here. Those are the only freedoms that we're allowed to discuss. Don't even pay any attention to the fact that your actual freedoms are being stripped away in DC right now. So. We're not gonna fall for that diversion tactic. Now, thank you all for tuning in to our show tonight. If 